presentation. Uh, this is part of a bigger project uh, funded by uh, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, uh, which tries to understand the impact of diasporas on Canadian foreign policy. There's a big argument out there in, uh, in politicians and in social groups that, it, especially in Canada, we have big groups of diaspora that can steer our foreign policy towards certain kinds of directions. Uh, of course, here in Alberta, it's easy. The Ukrainian diaspora, which is a massive diaspora, 1.2, 1.4 million people who actually associate themselves with the Ukrainian diaspora. Uh, but we also think about the Chinese diaspora, uh, either mainland, mainland or Hong Kong, uh, the Sikh diaspora. And we're trying to understand like whether or not they have an impact and, and how to do this. So it's an empirical question. Really, you know, can we find them? Can we uh, understand them? And can we see whether or not they have a capacity to influence policy? All right. So uh, this is the first part. So we have four parts. Uh, this is the first part where we're testing out ideas and we're testing out methods and, and trying to find a like a compelling way to talk about the data about this. Uh, and then we're going to start to do and compare the groups. Uh, this is on the Ukrainian diasporas. We have a project right now on uh, the Chinese diaspora during the Hong Kong uh, protests right, right now. We have a project on uh, the Asians in Quebec, because we're on a practical group. Uh, and we're doing also the Sikh diaspora and the uh, Tamil diaspora. So basically, four or five diasporas. All right, so here the, the research question, of course, is uh, can diaspora communities influence host states' foreign policy? Can a group of people that have a feat in both countries can influence the host country and steer policies toward certain kinds of direction. Um, so there's there's a contention in the literature. Uh, it, it has it's not at all clear whether or not that works. In fact, all the data we have in the U.S. or the, the Jewish diaspora, the Cuban diaspora, it's really hard to measure, and we have really different kinds of uh, data on that. Um, so uh, so here what we're going to do is essentially look at whether or not mobilization is a factor to explain influence. I'm going to go, and then like our, our case studies, the Crimean crisis. All right, so there's really two kinds of uh, dynamics that explains how diasporas can influence policies. The first one is that there needs to be a political environment in the host, country, host states that allows the diaspora to influence this. Like the argument here is that certain kinds of of, of political institutions allow for diaspora to have impact, and sometimes it's not. So it's, it's really about the host country. Uh, and the other argument is whether or not they're inherent to the characteristics of the diaspora. Maybe certain kinds of diaspora have a capacity to influence policies, and then we're going to try to figure out how and why. So a couple of hypotheses in the literature, size matters. In this case, the argument is that large diaspora groups have a capacity to influence policy, mostly through their political behavior, right? So parties will listen to large groups of people if they can mobilize and, and listen to certain kinds of people that they can have this, this impact. Uh, the, argument, the other argument is about economic resources. So certain kinds of diaspora community are actually more generous or uh, have more money to influence uh, and, and set up lobby groups. We think here of the Jewish diaspora in the US, for example, they're not a big group, really, in terms of electoral weight, but they have the capacity to lobby through the Congress, and then maybe that's what explains their influence. We're thinking a third argument, uh, which is really organizational strength. Maybe it's not about signs, maybe it's not about money, it's about the capacity of whether or not these groups can mobilize their members. If they can mobilize their members, push on uh, the government and on the Canadian or the, the, the host country, then maybe they, they'll get some influence. Uh, in this context, we perceive diaspora as more like a social movement than an actual lobby group or uh, something else. So we have to kind of think of, of, of these groups as, as uh, social movements. So two kinds of hypotheses. I'm an academic. I love hypotheses. Uh, the first one is, uh, do you know whether or not we can measure how the Ukrainian diaspora mobilized during the Crimean crisis? Did they mobilize? How can we measure this properly? Um, and the second question is whether or not how they frame the issue of the current crisis actually had an impact on how the government of Canada perceived, understood the current crisis, and whether or not it had an impact on uh, its relationship with Russia. Uh, so I'm going to give you the answer because I hate waiting. Um, 
So we have kind of confirmation on hypothesis one, and we're still out for grabs on hypothesis two. So we can see the diaspora mobilizing, uh, but we don't know, or we have a hard time kind of measuring whether or not they have an impact on policies uh, specifically. <coughs> so how did we do this? So how do you measure a social movement mobilizing in real time? So what we've done is we've essentially uh, collected tweets. We're gonna say, okay, in, in a post 21st century era, you know, social movements mobilize more and more online. They have a capacity to kind of organize themselves in such a way, and maybe you can, you can measure them and see them mobilize. So what we've done is we've collected all tweets published in Canada, all of them, from December 4th to March 23rd, 2014, which is basically the Euromaidan crisis. So basically when we start to have riots in Kiev up till the uh, Ukrainian referendum uh, on the status of Crimea. So one week, like I said, uh, uh, prior to major complication, one week uh, after the referendum, we've used a kind of all, uh, inclusive kind of uh, recipe, Crimea or Ukraine or Russia or a couple of hashtags. Uh, our goal was to grab everything. Um, and uh, so, and how we've done this, we actually have a guy at Twitter. Uh, we send them an email, they tell us how much it costs, and we buy the data. Uh, and they gave us everything. Um, it's not expensive, it's about $1,000 for a million tweets. Uh, the only problem is that they send you a massive JSON file that you have to pick up on the mainframe, and this one was like 122 gigs. So it took like a while to kind of compile and kind of download, and then we wrote a Python program to break this apart into a data set uh, and get rid of the pictures and stuff like that. Uh, overall, about in two months, about 200,000 tweets. It's actually 400,000 tweets. But then we realized that most, half of those tweets were actually about hockey. So we had to kind of clean the data set. <laughs> <laughs> because if you look like Russia and Ukraine, like, like, and then that's during the Sohi uh, Olympics, then like all the Canadians are tweeting about hockey. Uh, so we had to kind of clean that up of the data set, um, which took time. Uh, and about uh, 20,000 individual accounts, not uh, Twitter accounts. We get everything. Geolocation, retweets, likes, favorite, every, pictures, URL, Everything. Um, a little bit of geocoding, but it's not a lot. <clears throat> so what we get here, it's not just like it should be clear, but it's basically the, the time frame that we see here on, on how many tweets we see in Canada. And, and in this case, we see basically uh, five or six uh, important uh, period. The first one is the Irumaidan protests. Uh, where you see a clash here on the beginning, so a couple of tweets. So Canadians are responding to this. Then protesters will storm uh, the Ministry of Justice here, uh, and that's going to pick up in Canada. Then we'll have the Sohi uh, Olympics, so of course Russia picks up. This is the interesting part. This is a little green man appearing in Crimea. So in February 22, uh, the Russian Special Forces will start to deploy troops in, in Crimea. It's going to take governments and people to figure out what's happening, but on Twitter we get that chatter and we get that noise uh, before everybody else knows this. This is not the official uh, <coughs> date. We Actually, the, the Russian government hasn't officially determined the date when they start to invade Crimea. However, they started to give out medals to special for Russian special forces, and on the medal it says February 22nd. So we think that on February 22nd, this is where we start to have deployments of little green men. So essentially special forces that take out their uniforms and start to interact. It's going to take the Ukrainians, to be honest, and, and Canadians and everyone about two days to figure this out. But on Twitter, we get it, which is interesting. And the special forces are interested to see like how we can use Twitter to kind of understand things in real, world, in real time, even before the media picks it up. The big gap here is the official Russian invasion of Crimea. And the last one is the referendum on the crisis, and then it dies out, and it, it dies out. So this is basically how the, the distribution of the numbers of tweets is not super interesting. And we're trying to understand, like, how do we, how can we understand mobilization? So what we've done is essentially try to measure the network of tweets in Canada. So essentially, we've done a network analysis of the Twitter in, uh, relationship of Twitter accounts. 
So here, each dot is a Twitter account, and each line is a retweet. So what, what we're trying to really do is kind of measure and understand these communities and actions, how they interact with each other, which is a much more efficient way to understand mobilization and impact because A, it allows us to get rid of mostly the bots. Most bots don't retweet each other, don't have this kind of um, relationship, and it allows us to kind of understand how these accounts are connected with each other. The assumption here is that uh, if, we, if I know who you retweets, I know mostly in the grand scheme of things where you stand on these issues. And then I can measure what you're saying, and I can start to have a better understanding of how these groups are organized. Uh, so we have, so we did a Leuven algorithm to kind of measure these subclusters. Uh, we have six ones, uh, six subclusters. The big one, which is the, the, the light blue, are the Ukrainian diaspora. So uh, <laughs> why do we know? Mostly because, like, so here we have a couple of Christian Freeland and the Kiev Post, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. We have a couple of big, big dots, which are Ukrainian activists, which we've kept away from our data set. Do for their privacy concern. If you're a Russian person, you would love to see whose accounts you target. <laughs> uh, that's about, about 100,000 tweets, a little bit less. Then we have the Canadian government uh, tweets. Uh, Stephen Harper, uh, John Baird, uh, Canadian Embassy in Ukraine, uh, uh, Jason Kenney, and this is accounts connected to the uh, Canadian government. Then we have the dark blue, the francophones. We did it in French and English. Uh, and then we have uh, the orange one, which are normal Canadians. Justin Trudeau is that, is that group. Uh, he's not a prime minister yet. Uh, but yeah. not normal. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have right in the middle, uh, like both the Canadian and the international press. And finally, the yellow ones, which are actually pro-Russian accounts. So uh, accounts that are going to retweet um, Russian propaganda in Canada. Uh, these are Canadian accounts. Uh, a lot of them are still active. Uh, some of them are known associates to the Russian government. Some of them are just normal uh, government apparatus. Um, you see here WikiLeaks, uh, Colors of Russia, uh, RussianTimes.com, um, and that's in 2014. So before 2016, we see the kind of Russian kind of playing out what they're going to do with the American elections, basically. All right, so. <coughs> Here what we see is what? The biggest cluster is actually the Ukrainian diaspora. So we can see that on average, this, this, uh, the diaspora actually uses online, um, online platforms to mobilize and, and, and expand and connect with each other and kind of at least interact with each other a little bit more. Whether or not they have an impact on the Canadian uh, uh, framing, it's Difficult to say. Right now, what we see mostly is that the Ukrainian diaspora mobilizes way before Canadian government accounts. The Canadian government accounts mobilize mostly when Russia officially uh, invades um, Crimea, but not really before, which tells us that there is actually a lag between what the Canadian government really wants and understands as the issue and what the Ukrainian diaspora thinks it is the issue. Oh, see, John, you broke it. <laughs> All right, so measuring echo chambers. So here, this is a, the, the argument about uh, mobilization, right? Maybe these platforms allow people to mobilize with each other. And what we find is exactly that, is that on the, first, on the most hand, the Ukrainian diaspora will use Twitter, an online platform, to mostly retweet its own messaging. And their interaction with other actors in the, uh, in the landscape is actually limited. Here you have a little bit of retweets from the Canadian government, a lot of retweets somewhat from the international press, but most of, this, of its activity is between the Ukrainian diaspora. Like, it's a self-living ice cream cone. It's essentially Ukrainians retweeting about Ukrainians, so they use this as a mobilization process to, to frame their message and transfer information. They don't use it as much as we would hope to as a way to connect with other members of the Canadian population. Last one, so here what we've done is we started to say, well, okay, maybe we can, if we can't, can't measure really how the retweets go, maybe we can measure how the, there's a semantic similarity between the way the Ukrainian tweets are framed and the way the government of Canada tweets are framed. 
So what we've done uh, is we've used uh, what we call like a, a globe, which is a global vector, uh, which is a supervised learning algorithm that uses a neural net that is an extension from work to vet, uh, which was used by uh, Google AI. And it's essentially a way to represent words in, in a vector space, in a multidimensional uh, space. So it's not necessarily in terms of frequency, although globe uses a little bit of frequency, but it's essentially position the, the words in a vector space with the assumption that words that are in the vicinity of the, work, the vector space appear more often with each other than elsewhere and are more similar to each other than elsewhere. It allows us to kind of understand better which, which, uh, which words are important for which tweets and which community. And what we find here is uh, the blue, the light blue are actually the uh, Ukrainian tweets uh, and the, the Dark red are the Canadian government tweets. And what we find is a couple of things. The first is that most of the, the Ukrainian diaspora will focus on freedom and democracy and will use words specifically that targets those arguments. And will frame the issue in terms of this is a fight for a democratic uh, purpose. Uh, which is interesting because a lot of people in the Ukrainian diaspora kind of make the argument that the Ukrainians were talking about a little more and all these other kinds of things, which is not true. Actually, most of the words and most of the really important part were part were arguments about democracy. When you look at the Canadian government tweets, they focus mostly on the aggression of, of Russia and on the, the kind of illegal action that Russia is doing in Crimea. Thus, they kind of have a different perspective of what they're doing. For the Ukrainians, a fight for a, a revolution, for democracy, for freedom. And for the, the Canadian government, it's a problem of territorial integrity and having a great power invade another country. And we're not seeing as much or as many you know, talk about freedom uh, than we wish we were. My next, so this is where we are right now. We also have the Russians, which are super, <coughs> the Russians have talked about neo-Nazis and Svoboda, and they have like a completely different understanding of what the crisis is about. And they call this a coup and not like a revolution. Um, our, next, our next step for us is really to kind of start to measure and, and compare these groups to each other. So we're running right now what we call like a relaxed uh, word mover um, algorithm which allows to measure the distance between different groups and with the argument that that plus groups that are closer to each other will essentially be more semantically similar than groups that are far apart and with the vector space allows us to kind of measure that distance um, with all these words there's more than a hundred thousand words in our corpus um, and this is where we are it's kind of hard to do and we're still trying to figure this one out. And as soon as we get it, then we, I think we'll have a compelling argument of, like, this is what we're seeing, and this is how similar they are from other people. Thank you. Thank you. Was there time for questions? Yeah. Well, you did. You were, like, going through it. Like, oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, the Russian diaspora for the Crimean uh, takeover. Is there any data about there? Uh, so there, in Canada, there isn't a big Russian diaspora. Most of these accounts are actually not Russians. They're uh, far right groups, uh, KAnon, and all these kinds of things, WikiLeaks, and they're activists in Canada. But we, there isn't a lot of, you know, like clearly this is just somebody that's from Russia and retweets that. Most of the active accounts are actually organizations and, and people who retweets all sorts of things. A lot of those are still online. And if you look like Newsbreak, if you go and you look at their feed, they're, they're about everything. They're pro-Trump, they're, uh, they're anti-democracy, they're, they're interesting. I didn't answer your question though, right? Did I? Well, you told me that it's not visible to you. It's not. They don't do that at all. Besides Twitter, like what, what other data sources can you, ha. you grab like that? Right, so that's a question, right? So how do we, so one of the things we, like, so right now we have that, we can see that we can make a compelling argument about social media, diaspora, and relationship with foreign policy. But you're right, one of the questions we have, like, there must be like other factors of influence that are not just online. And here it's like more like a 
like a, a proxy to something that we're seeing, right? We're not seeing it online. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do, for example, is is look at how they like like contribution to political parties and candidates. And it's a it's super hard <laughs> because I mean we can find these organizations they actually kind of contribute to political parties and candidates, but then like do I really know whether like Nedochenko, which sounds like Ukrainian, it is Ukrainian, but you know how can I kind of look on a data set say like this is Ukrainian, this is Polish, this is it's a it's like we we can't really kind of, kind of say like, these are Ukrainians and they're only Ukrainians, uh, so we have a hard time. We, we have conversations with MPs or people who work in government, and they tell us, like, yes, we are lobbied all the time by these groups. And they have a kind of, uh, they have, like, a ground game that is actually really good, right? They go to these pierogi parties, and they say, oh, well, let me talk to you about Ukraine and Crimea. And people from Ottawa tell us, like, yeah, every time I go to my, my writing in, in Wood Buffalo, then I get all these conversations about Russia. So we know that the community is actually doing this, and somehow... Based on just anecdotes, we know that they're having, they're talking to people. Uh, one of the other arguments we're trying to do is whether or not that has an impact on uh, what MPs say in the House of Commons. So we can take uh, the House of Commons answer and kind of measure this. And what would be kind of cool is use this kind of method, that globe method, and see whether or not that framing is reused in the House of Commons. So we have a kind of different strategies to do this. But that becomes like five, six, seven, eight papers, and we try to do this. And that's kind of more hard to do than answer. It's a good question. <laughs>